Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Ian is away. Tonight, a bus ride through the ashes of a community burned to the ground. Residents returned to Lytton, BC for the first time since wildfire chased them out. The devastation of our home being destroyed, and it was heartbreaking. A glimpse at what's left of their community. Also tonight, kicking off the greatest outdoor show on earth. This will be a very different Calgary stampede. The 14-year-old who has captured the world's attention. M-U-R-R-A-Y-A. That is correct. <laughs> How she spelled her way into the history books. And taking a trip this summer, a destination out of this world. It's taking space tourism to a next level. And a little bit closer to home. Guys, there's a wolf up here. This is The National. This was a very tough, very emotional day for residents of Lytton, British Columbia. After fleeing with just minutes to spare as a wildfire suddenly raced through the village last week. Today, some of them went back. And this is what they saw. So much of the village utterly destroyed. This was residents' first chance to see the devastation in person. Several buses carrying residents took that drive today, then one carrying media did. Katie Nicholson was on it and joins us from Spence's Bridge tonight. Katie, uh, describe that moment for us of first entering Lytton. You know, Asha, it's, it's, it's one thing to see these photos emerge after the fire, quite another thing to see them roll by your window as you drive through what used to be a town. It makes it hit home and hit hard exactly the level of devastation felt by the people of Lytton, and that is exactly what happened today as they took this tour. The scorched violence of the Lytton fire on full display. Nothing left of homes but chimneys and charred bathtubs. Underneath this buckled metal was once the health center. The liquor store, now nothing on its shelves but soot. It was very difficult today. We just couldn't believe it. It's like a nightmare. This devastation, too much for some to bear. They opted out of today's organized bus tour. Others went in their place. Until you actually see it, it's hard to believe. Um, it will be really difficult, but I think it's the right decision for me. I understand why others don't want to go. For myself, I just want to see it with my own eyes. And it's yeah. going to be tough, but I just want to have closure. The fate of Lytton so closely intertwined with the Lytton First Nation, whose main reserve was leveled. That's where most of our people are living. And this was just totally devastated. I think there's one home that is saved, but uh, left uh, standing. But you know, this is so hard uh, on everyone. The village of Lytton was also an essential hub for those who live nearby. I still don't know where I'm going to bank, uh, where my medical records are. Uh, I mean, I have a prescription I need refilled. From her pub just 34 kilometers up the road, Lori Kingston offers words of support. Okay. They're just a beautiful, warm people. And although they've lost their houses, they've lost pets, they've lost neighbors and friends, they've lost their community. And that's one of the strongest points of Lytton, is a very, very strong sense of community. And for all the loss and devastation, some hope Lytton will rise again. Somehow, against all odds, this house still standing, a reminder of what was and what could be again. So surreal to watch that, Katie. Uh, the cause of the fire still under investigation. What's the latest there? Well, I can tell you that Transportation Safety Board inspectors are in Lytton today. Uh, this after new information came to light, which triggered the TSB's involvement in this investigation. Of course, there has been widespread speculation this fire was started by a passing train. So that's happening. And also, much to the relief of neighboring communities, the Transport Minister has ordered that no trains move through Lytton for at least the next 48 hours. Katie, thank you. You're welcome. 
That fire is one of more than 800 wildfires that have sparked in B.C. so far this year. Tonight, more than 200 of them are still burning. Lightning is suspected to have caused most, but for a significant number, the cause is still listed as unknown. Canada's COVID-19 situation continues to improve. As cases decline and vaccinations rise, there's hope ahead. And today, some growth on the economic front. As a result of lifting some pandemic restrictions, job numbers soared in June. Statistics Canada says 231,000 net jobs were created, especially in the hard-hit sectors of hospitality and retail. But they are all part-time and most went to younger workers. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, the job market's recovery isn't just about numbers and may face some new challenges along the way. Sophia Pappas is relieved to be working at a restaurant again. It's uh, nice things are opening up again. It's exciting. Last month, more than 160,000 youth landed jobs. This restaurant owner says he's hiring young people because his older, more experienced staff have moved on. Some of the people that we're taking have no experience, so we've got to start from scratch because that's well we could find. June's rehiring surge was all part-time positions. In fact, full-time work dropped. And compared to before the pandemic, there are still 330,000 fewer full-time jobs in Canada. Recovering jobs is great, but the headcount isn't enough. It's the quality of jobs that also matters. As cases of COVID-19 decline and restrictions lift, confidence in the economy is coming back. According to a recent survey by the Bank of Canada, businesses across all sectors plan to do more hiring than ever before. But as the job market rebounds, Statistics Canada says more workers may take risks, such as changing jobs or leaving the workforce entirely. Employers are going to have to become people magnets. If they want to avoid labor and skill shortages, they're going to have to make uh, it clear that they value their workers, that they are willing to pay them well and provide working conditions that support them as whole human beings, not just as workers. For Lindsay Richardson, that means more flexible work. For the past year, Richardson worked two full-time jobs as an HR professional and a parent. I hit a wall. The burnout was so great. As a result, she recently quit. Employers are going to have to pivot and make massive changes to retain top talent like myself because I won't come back if I can't come back to something that works for myself and my family. For some workers, the economy's reopening is a much-needed opportunity to return to normal and get back on track. <laughs> A mum drop? For others, it's a chance to leave the past year behind. <laughs> Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And thanks to strong vaccination rates, people in Ontario will soon be able to do a lot more as the province speeds up its reopening plan. But as Travis Danraj tells us, the move is not without some risk. Tony Zaccone didn't have to call any of his clients to tell them the news. We didn't have to make any phone calls. Our phone's been ringing off the hook all day. As soon as they made the announcement, bang, 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 like they're still on the phone right now. The so, Ottawa uh, wedding venue owner yeah, says after so a I year and a half uh, and nearly half a million years. dollars in lost sales, he's looking forward to so moving events thing. from this because small room. And this is where we shine. This is where we want to put 200 people together. To this one. We've been waiting a long time for this. And, uh, and so, are, so have my, uh, my brides and grooms as well. Uh, a lot of parties we have been having to push off. People have been uh, rebooking dates two, three times and stuff. Ontario will move to stage three next Friday, five days ahead of schedule. This means people will be able to enjoy even more activities they've missed, such as going to the gym. Indoor dining, casinos, museums and movie theatres can also open up. Concerts, festivals and nightclubs will be permitted with limited capacity. Good news, but with a note of caution. Folks, this isn't over by any means. We, we still have a, a, a good battle on our hands. So let's, let's not be out there doing the victory lap whatsoever. Indeed, some Ontario regions are dealing with rapid variant spread, including Owen Sound and Waterloo, which has some experts worried. The Delta, the variant, is very volatile, very explosive, and we just need to move carefully. We might need to stay to, uh, the next, in the next step for quite a while. You know, just to basically lift everything is probably far too problematic. Still, Ontario is in a much stronger place thanks to soaring vaccination rates. The vaccines have had a massive, massive positive impact. 
when we start to have close to you know, 80% of eligible people with at least the first dose of a vaccine. With a sizable number of Ontarians not fully vaccinated, the risk now is the spread of the dangerous variants. Delta and the new Lambda variant now established in the province. Something health officials will be watching very closely. Travis Danresh, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, with Alberta's pandemic restrictions lifted, the Calgary Stampede is underway. And this year, it's a different kind of rodeo. Carolyn Dunn shows us how. The Calgary Stampede, unbelievable! The greatest outdoor show on earth is back. I just love the Stampede, and I've been waiting for two years. But not without some COVID precautions. Workers are wearing masks. Guests can make their own choice. Cleaning and sanitization is increased, and they're asking everyone to distance. Even the iconic Stampede Parade had a very different feel to it. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney came in on horseback. Nahed Nenshi followed in his final parade as Calgary's mayor. But there were no crowds lining the streets for this virtual event. For Nenshi, that made sense. This year, the Stampede is about honouring what we've been through. It's about honouring the front line and the essential workers. It's about honouring what we've lost in COVID, but it's about turning the page. Plenty of people are intent on doing just that, lured by the excitement of the midway or the zen that can only be found in a barn. We drive up for eight hours. Paul Ma and his family drove overnight from Saskatchewan to attend their very first stampede. My family all have the full vaccine night. If they plan to attend a country concert at the famed venue Nashville North, they'll have to show proof of that vaccination or take a rapid COVID test before entering. That's to ensure the biggest concerts don't become super spreader events. But that proof of vaccination is a slippery slope, according to some privacy experts. Because in Canada, we're not the kind of place where we are accustomed to having to show our papers to prove that we've made a socially acceptable choice about our health Nothing is truly normal about this stampede, but it's closer to normal than many have experienced in many months. Carolyn, do we know how many people actually turned out today? No, Asha, we don't actually know precise numbers. And according to the stampede, we're not going to find out until the end of this 10-day event. Unlike years past where success was measured by attendance, this year they say the goal is basically to have a COVID-safe event that is enjoyable for all the guests. You have to remember, too, that attendance has been capped at about half of the normal capacity. So we're not going to hit any records in 2021, regardless of how many people choose to come down here to the grounds. Carolyn, thank you. Some history and some heartbreak for Canadian tennis star Denis Shapovalov at Wimbledon today. He played in his first ever Grand Slam semifinal, but in the end lost to the best in the world. Salima Shivji has that. We are ready for the second semifinal. It's not quite Wimbledon, but perhaps a close second to watch the action. In the crowd, quite a few British fans of a Canadian Denis Shapovala. We love an underdog, especially here in Britain. Just seeing somebody coming through for their first semifinal and looking confident is a great thing. He's young, he's fresh. We haven't seen him in, at Wimbledon before. So keep going. Over at Wimbledon, Brenda Taylor's allegiance is on display. He's got the talent, he's got the shots, he's got the energy, and I think when he's playing at his best, he can win. The stakes were high. The 22-year-old hoping to prove he belongs in his first Grand Slam semi versus the heavy favourite. And they both did their homework. Yeah, it's definitely a big challenge for sure. Uh, you know, obviously he's been playing super, super well this season. It's going to be a, a battle and I need to be at my best. We have a, a rare talent. Five years ago, Shapovalov won the boys' title here. Djokovic at that point had already won 12 Grand Slams. Fast forward to today on equal ground, the slate clean. Oh, what a smash! For years, Adriano Fiorivia coached a teenage Shapovalov. Make it! Nice cat! He's still coaching the next generation, thinking of his former star pupil at center court, an ocean away. He's fearless. He always had the fire, always had the athletic ability, always wanted to make great shots. Oh, 
takes it. He did make some great shots today, but so did Djokovic. The Canadian, increasingly frustrated, just couldn't pull off the win against the world number one. And lipless. It was over in three straight sets. Shapovalov bitterly disappointed and unable to hold back the tears, even as the crowd and his opponent celebrated his play. We're going to see a lot of him in the future, definitely. He's a great player. The future very bright for the young Canadian, not yet at his peak. Salima Shivji, CBC News, London. After becoming the first female national chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Roseanne Archibald is setting an ambitious agenda and facing her first major test. Here's Olivia Stefanovic. We are going to stare this straight in the face and kick colonial policies to the curb. Celebrated for her historic victory, Roseanne Archibald now faces the challenge of entering an office she's been at odds with. I'm committed to creating safe and healthy working spaces for everyone. That commitment made during her first press conference as national chief and following an internal report commissioned by the AFN, obtained by CBC News, investigating allegations of bullying and harassment against her which she wouldn't comment on specifically. Seven out of 10 complainants spoke to an independent investigator, but none filed a formal complaint, citing fears of retribution. I have felt that this happened because of reprisal, because in December, I stood up for a resolution calling for an independent review on harassment and bullying of women. Archibald supports implementing one of the report's main recommendations, a policy to protect whistleblowers within the AFN. I hope that she's able to um, move forward and I trust that she'll create a, that trusting and respectful workplace. The accusations aren't shaking her supporters. Roseanne Archibald is quite a responsible, very um, no-nonsense but very true to her heart and in her vision. Chief Archibald is going to be uh, a strong partner, not just for First Nations, but for all Canadians. I'm not just one, hi, I'm gonna be your friend all the time. Archibald already had her first conversation as national chief with Justin Trudeau. In her first 100 days, she wants to lay out an ambitious agenda from creating a post-pandemic recovery plan to unifying the AFN. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. A 14-year-old girl has done what no other African-American has done before. M-U-R-R-A-Y-A. That is correct. <laughs> Next on The National, her historic spelling bee win and her big plans for the future. Just about everything I do, I'm good at. The billionaire space race is about to lift off. It's taking space tourism to a next level. What it means for the rest of us back here on Earth. And spectacular staycation in Canada's north. Very few people in the world get to experience this. Guys, there's a wolf up here. A rare glimpse inside one of Canada's most remote national parks. We're back in two. This brings the total number of confirmed fatalities to 78. The casualties continue to mount in Surfside, Florida, after another 15 victims were recovered from the site of a condo building collapse. After more than two weeks of searching, authorities say hope of finding survivors has been lost. But they remain committed to recovering the remains of the 61 people still missing. Some surreal video coming out of New York as commuters struggle through waist-high water in several of the city's subway stations. It's the result of Tropical Storm Elsa's heavy rains, strong wind gusts and tornado warnings. Parts of Atlantic Canada are expected to be affected by this storm over the weekend. A 14-year-old girl from Louisiana has taken the internet by storm after her historic victory at the Scripps National Spelling Bee. And as Chris Reyes tells us, Zaila Avant-Garde is only getting started. M-U-R-R-A-Y-A. That is correct. <laughs> a champion 
for the history books. 14-year-old Zaila Avangard is the first African-American winner in the 96-year history of the Scripps National Spelling Bee. You better believe she's overjoyed. It felt really good to win because I had been working on it for like two years, so to actually win the whole thing was like a dream come true. That dream now an inspiration to so many. She's also earned some new high-profile fans. Barack Obama tweeted, Your hard work is paying off. We're all proud of you. President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Michelle Obama all beamed with pride on social media. NASA tweeted, the word is star, definition, Zaila avant-garde. First Lady oil. Jill Biden, a proud teacher, Narrowly was in the audience oil. to watch her win. P -O avant-garde beat out 10 other finalists at the ESPN campus in Florida. The teen said she wasn't nervous at all. In the final moments before the victory, she even asked the judges, for this clue about her final word. Does this word contain like the English name Murray, which could be the name of a comedian? I don't see that here. It couldn't have gone any better, and I got to make a joke uh, on my winning word. The teen from Harvey, Louisiana, has a sense of humor and a sense of history. It felt really great to be the first African-American uh, champion because it's just night, almost 100 years of no uh, African-American. Avant-garde is a trailblazer not just on the spelling bee stage, but on the basketball court, too. Her confidence is on point. Just about everything I do, I'm good at. It's true. She holds three Guinness World Records for dribbling. She has ambitions to play in the WNBA, to attend Harvard, and, oh yeah, possibly win a Nobel Prize. I like, saw the two women who won um, Nobel Prizes uh, for gene editing. I've been looking into that, too. And with her track record, anything is possible. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Definitely keep your eye out for Zaila. Bravo. <laughs> Canadian athletes are now preparing to compete without Olympic spectators. The fans in the stands doesn't make us go faster and higher and stronger. Up next, Chef de Mission Marnie McBean on the feeling inside Team Canada. And later. I'm really glad that we're here this year. The return of one of the biggest film festivals in the world. Khan makes its COVID comeback. The Olympic cauldron was lit in Tokyo today, two weeks ahead of the game's opening ceremonies, to much less fanfare than past games. The city is under a state of emergency and won't be allowing spectators to watch the events. But still, the games push ahead, an unstoppable force and a multi-billion dollar investment. And as Team Canada makes its way to Tokyo, many are wondering what impact this will have on the athletes. For Canadians, a familiar face headed to Tokyo is Marnie McBean. The three-time Olympic gold medalist and current chef de mission is acquainted with the Olympics in a way few get to be. The ultimate insider who understands what it takes to compete and to lead. Part of your job as chef de mission with these games is, is mentoring and preparing the athletes. What are you hearing from them in such an unprecedented time? Well, they're focused right now. Like you said, we're two weeks from the opening ceremony. Um, they're, they're very focused on their job and the work that they do and all the protocols that they have been going through, all the, like everyone, all the hoops that they've been jumping through for the last 18 months to uh, protect their communities, to protect themselves. Um, and they have a very clear eye on, on what their goal is, and that's to go to the Olympics and to perform to their very best. Well, I'm glad to hear that they are focused because it just seems day by day there's always something new, some new development mm -hmm. out of Tokyo. Now they're under a state of emergency, as we know, because yeah. of this resurgence in COVID-19 cases, partly connected to that Delta variant. Uh, so what does mm -hmm. the state of emergency, how does that change things for Team Canada? Or does it? Yeah, so the, the way I see it is there's two populations that will be in Tokyo for the Olympic Games. There is, and I'll talk first about the in the in the bubble population, and that's the athletes. So the state of emergency, I don't mean to sound callous, but the state of emergency doesn't affect what's gonna happen inside of the bubble. And that has been for over a year, um, been gonna happen under strict protocols. Uh, originally, 
um, and it was without a vaccine. But now we're, we're very grateful that the athletes from around the world, because of the um, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, IOC partnership, the population inside that Olympic bubble is going to be 70, possibly 90 percent vaccinated um, and ideally with both vaccines. So there, there's a, a potential that it'll be the most heavily vaccinated city in the world. Um, and that population won't be interacting with the city of Tokyo. So the state of emergency and the no uh, spectators in the stands, that's really protecting the people of Tokyo from the people of Tokyo, because there, there is uh, no movement between um, that barrier. What about the piece that means athletes will be competing without spectators? Uh, mm -hmm. Here's what yes, one right. athlete had to say about that. What's sad about it is that, you know, once you win or if you lose, that's when you're going to get the reaction from fans. And those are moments that you want to be able to share with fans. I mean, that's just a huge part of these games. Yeah, it is. And, and later in that interview, Jet, that was Jen Kish, our, uh, one of our rugby athletes um, from 2016. Later in that interview, her advice to athletes was to really enjoy it. Uh, we would love to have our friends and family with us, no doubts. That would be amazing. But uh, the, the fans in the stands doesn't make us go faster and higher and stronger. Um, they, they are witnesses to, to what we're doing. Um, we would love to have that kind of energy there. But what we're seeing, um, you know, even if we look at the, the, the swim trials that recently happened, um, athletes were having personal best performances, Canadian records, uh, top best times um, in the world. There's no fans in, in the stands. Um, so while it is really disappointing that we don't have that immediate opportunity to share, one of the things that this pandemic has brought us is, you know, the magic of Zoom. Um, and so there is an ability for all athletes to share with their friends and family uh, in a way that they haven't. Not, it's, it's, it's a real privilege to have your friends and family be able to travel to the Olympic Games. It's extraordinarily expensive. Um, and it's a, uh, a price that many families are willing to pay. But now every um, uh, athlete is going to be able to um, be looking and talking to their friends and family in their room the night before their race. And um, I know the IOC and the Canadian Olympic Committee are working really hard to get those connections um, right after the race. So not having fans in the stands um, is, is very disappointing, you know, that, that whole, whole roar of the crowd. But athletes have been training uh, to perform. This is their work and what they do. And, um, you know, I, I was a rower and it's a 2,000 meter course, and for 1,500 meters, I, d I didn't hear anybody, and it, I didn't go faster because I got closer to the grandstand, and I could suddenly hear what was going on. Um, I was actually exhausted. I probably went slower when I could hear the fans, <laughs> but um, athletes are professional at what they're doing, and you know, Jen definitely um, had some incredible moments jumping up to her family after the performance of her game. Um, they weren't part of the performance during the game for her, though. Yeah. Well, uh, safe travels, Marnie, and we wish you and Team Canada the best of luck. We'll be rooting for you. Thank you very much. In the world of fencing, most elite athletes are in their 20s or 30s. Canadian Jessica Guo is an exception. She'll turn 16 just as the Olympics begin, making her the youngest Canadian fencer competing in Tokyo. Earlier this summer, she sat down to chat with Andrew at her fencing club in Markham, Ontario. Fencing is one of those sports you've definitely seen before, but probably don't understand, beyond the fact that it's fast and old, very old. But this is a sport that is as 21st century as it gets, the highest tech event you will see at these Olympic Games. So, no surprise, one of its brightest stars... We have a new world champion... ...is among the youngest on Canada's Olympic team. Jessica, very yeah. nice to meet you. Hi. How are you feeling? Good, great today. How nervous are you? Nervous about the Olympics coming yes, up? Yes, very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was talking to, uh, to uh, the owner here just a, a moment ago, yeah. and he was telling me that you basically get this whole place to yourself. Yeah, I do. Um, because of COVID, there's a lot less people coming in because of the restrictions. So I'm usually the only one here with like some of my teammates to train with and my coach. Yeah, he told yeah. me the whole place is closed yeah. except for Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> Just for me. <laughs> Jessica started fencing at age six. Before long, she was traveling the world competing. And in her age group, she's one of Canada's best. So... I've seen enough of you in competition to know that 
you're good. You're really yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but I don't know enough about the sport to understand why you're so good. Oh. <laughs> what is it about you that that makes you at, at this level? Well, a lot of people say like fencing is like a chess game, but moving. So I guess a lot of times is that you have to be able to kind of outsmart your opponent with your tactics, and then that's how you're able to win. But also using like endurance and strength, that's a big part of it. But most of it is like a mind game. You know, when I, when I was watching um, some of your competitions, actually, I mean, you hear the, 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 the weapons, you hear yeah. the ting, 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 yeah, ting, ting. Yeah. But then every once in a while, after a really intense back and forth, one of the fencers will just scream. <laughs> Like, yeah. like one of these, like a primal yeah. blood, cur and I've heard you yeah. do that too. What's yeah. going on there? Um, well, a lot of times it's because you're very nervous and then you're trying to release like the nerves after getting a touch. But then also sometimes it's just to celebrate and being like, yay, like after this long battle, like I'm, it's, I got this amazing touch and you're just happy and celebrating. Are you taught to scream that way? Is yeah, that a lot of beginners are taught to be, once you go to competition, you should scream and forcefully sometimes the coaches be like at the start of the match the first few touches just scream at any touch you get and sometimes they'll be like even if you don't it's not your touch you should scream because sometimes it actually convinces and persuades the ref in a kind of way to give you the touch sometimes it's an iffy call and if you scream you're confident so then they'll give the touch to you and do you think about intimidating your opponents yeah yeah it's very intimidating <laughs> <laughs> what do your friends think do you feel like they, they get it? Like they, they understand all of the work that you're putting into and that they understand your sport? Um, I think they definitely know that I put in a lot of work into fencing because I travel so much, but I don't think they necessarily know how fencing works itself because they ask a lot of questions like, oh, like, can it go through you? Or like, does it- Can you get does, a pail? Yeah, <laughs> like, how does that work? So then I have to explain it to them, but it's just very fun explaining and talking to them. We talked a little bit about Tokyo. Yeah. But what are your expectations in Tokyo? I don't have that many expectations, but I really want to medal with my team in team event. And that would be very, very exciting just to stand on the podium with the team and just to enjoy the moment. But also individual medal would be great too. <laughs> You're also pretty young though. Yeah. Do you, you must think about the long game too, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's not all about these games Yeah. So, like, tell me, tell me a little bit about that, like your perspective going in. Well, I guess I obviously have long-term plans. So I guess for the first, this Tokyo Olympics, I'm just planning on getting the experience I need for like future Olympics if I want to do better and like kind of get the feel of how it works for, to prepare myself for future Olympics if I get in. <laughs> and are you thinking beyond Tokyo, but even beyond fencing in terms of like what you want to study later or what kind of work you want to um, do? I do want to go into the med field and I really want to be a surgeon, but I don't know yet. <laughs> it's, it does strike me that you're saying this in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> has, that, has that changed the way you think? Um, there's been a lot of like deaths obviously and a lot of people are struggling. So I know that I do want to help people with these skills if I attend medical school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jessica, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Best of luck to you. Thank you. The opening ceremony is just two weeks away. Adrian will be co-hosting CBC's coverage from Japan. That's on Friday, July 23rd. The biggest black-led TV series is now in production, but one of the creators says it wasn't an easy journey. I was told straight to my face in some circumstances that there was not an audience. Next on The National, black creators on what gives them hope and why representation matters. I'm really glad that we're here this year. Cannes Film Festival, the world's biggest and arguably most glamorous, has made a comeback, giving people a seat at the theater for the first time in a long time. It was wonderful to be in a movie theater. Really, really, really great. There are fewer people and fewer parties this year, but the message is clear. Cinema 2 is back.
to be in a room with a thousand other people because we all love the same thing. Like it just, it was such a great reminder of why we do this and why we get together like this. 24 films are up for this year's top prize and among the festival's official selection, a Canadian production. Director Spike Lee is heading up the jury that chooses the winners, the first black person to hold this role. Despite some progress in recent years, black creators in this country still face many challenges to get funding or support for their work. But as Eli Glasner tells us, there's a group of Canadian directors determined to change that. Oh, this is really cool. In a costume department in Winnipeg, producer and actor Arnold Pinnock is excited to share how his show about black railway porters is springing to life. It's a bit crazy. Once just an idea, this CBC and BET Plus co-production set in the 1920s is the biggest black-led TV series in Canadian history. Being on this show and you have young black boys and girls who are on this show and you can see it how they look. It's like, wait a minute, that's what I want to do now. Yeah. And, and or, or see, better yet, see Charles and RT or Anne-Marie or Marsha you know, and, and they, what did they do? Oh, those are the showrunners. Those are the directors. But getting the green light wasn't easy. I, I definitely know, it wasn't the first project that I pitched. And, you know, in the past, I was told straight to my face in some circumstances that there was not an audience. And action! After a tumultuous year, the industry has pledged to change. Telefilm now has an equity and representation action plan. But a new report from the Canadian Media Fund still points to unfulfilled global demand for content from Indigenous, Black or racialized creators. Because it's based on funding... Kelly Fife Marshall is part of a new vanguard of Canadian directors trying to change that. Her short film, Black Bodies, earned a shout-out from American director Ava DuVernay. But many of her Canadian colleagues still struggle. Like, how are we helping people that are in the middle ground like I am and my peers? You know, how are we helping people at the top who have been struggling for 15 to 20 years in the industry and are not where they, where, where they should be and where they deserve to be? You know, it's about how do we, how do we change the systems and the infrastructure? The good news, Eli, is I, I have actually noticed a change. After 20 years, director Jennifer Holness was tired of waiting and fighting and was ready to pack it in. I really was because it just felt like it was so tough. Now broadcasters are calling her for a new series on the history of the black experience in Canada. There is a real willingness to, to, to play, a, a willingness to say, okay, we're going to give you a shot and it's going to be a meaningful shot. Like many, she says there's more work to be done, but she's encouraged to show how black lives are a vital part of Canada's story. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, space flight is about to enter a new era. Why it's not just about the billionaires. Plus, very few people in the world get to experience this, this very incredible and special place. A rare glimpse inside one of Canada's most remote national parks. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This weekend could see a winner in the billionaire space race. Richard Branson is poised to be the first among three billionaires to travel to space aboard rockets they each helped fund. Anayat Singh now on what that could mean for the future of space exploration. It could be an important moment in the billionaire space race. Astronaut 001 Richard Branson. Two. One, release, release, release. If his launch is successful, Richard Branson on board his Virgin Galactic space vehicle will beat Amazon founder Jeff Bezos in ushering in a new era of private commercial space travel. All right, here we go. Guys, how exciting is this? Come on. It's taking space tourism to a next level, opening up a more affordable, still not very affordable, but a more affordable way for tourists to go into space. On Sunday, Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 is set to travel at least 80 kilometers above the Earth, considered to be spaced by the U.S. Air Force. On July 20th, Blue Origin's New Shepard with Bezos on board will fly higher, to 100 kilometers, making it to the internationally recognized edge of space, 
called the Karman Line. We're go for launch. Let's light this candle. SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, is also getting into the tourism game in the coming months and years after already establishing its dominance in the commercial rocket launch industry. NASA also has contracts to carry future payloads with Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. Joshua Kutrick is one of Canada's four current astronauts. He sees the upcoming space flights as a sign of fundamental change. It's hugely positive for, for everything, for, for, for what we do here at the Canadian Space Agency and, and of course for those companies that are involved. Um, I think it represents a lot of opportunity for the future. And while only a privileged few will get to be space tourists, there are potential impacts for the rest of us. Every single day, everything you do has a component of space in it, whether it's your phone, your GPS, buying groceries, getting gas. Meaning a lot of people will have a stake in a successful launch of these flights. In Ayat Singh, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, back here on Earth, some Canadians have been able to enjoy the remote beauty of one special place this summer for the first time in a year. Wild and vast, Ivavik National Park is so far north, visitors have to fly in. Mackenzie Scott shares the experience. This landscape, rarely seen from the air or on foot, this is Ivavik National Park. Located in the most northern part of Yukon, created as part of the Inuvaluits land claim in 1984. Very few people in the world get to experience this, this very incredible and special place. Uh, and when they do, it's, it's quite an exciting adventure. Closed last season because of COVID-19 restrictions, the park is open again. Pre-pandemic, just under 150 people came here each year. Right. Few from the north. We hadn't heard about Ivavik. And uh, I can't believe we haven't. This year, the only 23 visitors to the park's base camp are all from the Northwest Territories because of a special exemption allowing them to visit Yukon and return home without isolating. We just sent out the mass email to folks that we thought who might be interested. Right there, there's a wolf up here. Guys, there's a wolf up here. The park takes visitors on catered trips, giving them closer views of wildlife and breathtaking hikes. <laughs> Anuvia Look Alder Barbara Archie is eager to share her stories and skills. Last year we missed it. Yeah, nobody came out, so that was pretty hard. For Mark Frazier, the park's been a safe escape for him and his daughter. We often go south, like a lot of people do, when it, when it comes time to vacation. And to see my daughter's eyes light up when she's seen sheep or a wolf or, or just some of the views has been, it's been pretty amazing. Although border restrictions have prevented some visitors from traveling into Ivivik National Park this year, Parks Canada is hopeful that travelers from around the globe will be able to come next year. And more than a dozen visitors are already booked to see the spectacular landscape in 2022. Mackenzie Scott, CBC News, Ivivik National Park. The moment is next, but first, Canada's newest and largest territory is celebrating Nunavut Day. Some marked the occasion by taking part in a contest to decorate houses, boats and sheds, while others shared striking images of life in the vibrant Northern Territory. Nunavut Day marks Parliament's passing of the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement back in 1993, paving the way for Nunavut's official creation in 1999. This woman from PEI was surprised with a bouquet of roses from a complete stranger. Katie Martin and her sisters are giving away what they call Bernie's Bunches. And the kind gesture and the meaning behind it is our moment. I was getting groceries, coming out of the grocery store. I heard a woman saying, excuse me. She started walking towards me and she had this big bouquet of red roses in her hand. This is what my family like to call a Bernie's Bunch. So my mum's name was Bernadette and uh, she passed away in 2014 um, of ovarian cancer. Every year on her birthday and on Mother's Day, uh, myself and both my sisters and my cousin go and give a bunch of flowers to a random stranger as a way of memorialising my mum and as a way of bringing a smile to somebody else who wasn't expecting it on that day. I thought, what an honour for her to pick me, but 
I'm glad she did because it moved me. In her saddest moment, this is what she wanted to do for somebody. She wanted to make somebody happy. I kind of started to tear up right away. But this is why we do it. We, we give the flowers so we can remember her and in a nice way. Because she was a lovely woman. And of course, this beautiful act of kindness made the rounds online. People on social media were sending out messages to both Kate and Stephanie describing ways they want to pay it forward after seeing the post. So something to consider this weekend, brighten someone's day. That is The National for this July the 9th. Good night.